Well, welcome to Grace Baptist Church and our online service. Why we are doing a service this way, obviously, is because we cannot meet in our building. Uh, and so the people of God, uh, we meet wherever we can, however we can. We are really the building. We are the, the house of God, the people of God. We are the living stones that make up the temple of God. Uh, and so we cannot physically meet uh, in our church building, uh, but we can meet this way electronically, and we're thankful for that. Uh, and hopefully it won't be all that long, uh, but for this week and maybe the next few weeks and maybe a few more, however the Lord would will, uh, we'll meet this way. Uh, and instead of, of live streaming, we believe this is better than live streaming uh, because it's more of a, of a real service sense where we we'll prayers and we can uh, listen to and sing along with songs that we know, hear the word, of course, and then even at the end, uh, there'll be some questions uh, which we can uh, answer uh, from the sermon that's just been preached. Also, I would say we, we should remain in touch as best as possible, and we can do that through the Facebook pages that we have and our text, Sports You apps. Uh, and if you're not getting those, if you're not connected in some way, please call me and we'll put you on and get you connected. You can call me at 646-208-1651. Uh, and so, turn with me now as we look in Matthew chapter 19, verses 16 to 22. Matthew chapter 19, verses 16 to 22. A familiar passage. We know it as the rich young ruler. Uh, and we'll read that, and then we'll pray and we'll, we'll dig in. There we read in verse 16, Now behold, one came and said to him, Good teacher, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? So he said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one, that is God. But if you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. He said to him, Which ones? Jesus said, You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness. Honor your father and your mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said to him, All these I have kept from my youth. What do I still lack? Jesus said to him, If you want to be perfect, go, sell what you have, and give to the poor. And you will have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Let's pray. Father, as we now come to your word, we pray that you would open our ears, touch our hearts to receive your word and to believe your word, to be moved by your word. Please help me. I pray that it would not be a distraction because we're not in the same building at the same time, but Lord, your word would penetrate our hearts. And Lord, it would be good for us to have listened to it even now. Lord, magnify your name. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, everybody, everybody wants to go to heaven. Rare is the person you will meet who will say they don't want to go to heaven. All over the world, people are trying to measure up, to be good enough to gain eternal life and to go to heaven. So they do things like fast, or they say so many prayers a day, they try keeping the law, they try doing good deeds. They do a hundred different things hoping that their good will outweigh their bad and God will accept them. And in Matthew chapter 19, verses 16 to 22, we have such a young man. He wanted to know what good thing he had to do in order to have eternal life. And so our first point today will be the desire, the desire. And again, we read in verse 16, Now behold, one came to him and said, Good teacher, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? So we have a young man, which verse 22 tells us that he's rich, and Luke tells us that he is a ruler, and Mark tells us that he comes running up to Jesus and kneels before him. So what we have is one very impressive young man, humanly speaking. He is young, he is rich, he has some sort of authority, uh, and as we will see, he is a morally upright man, and he is a religious man, and he is a man of good character. He is an observer of the law, and he is concerned about spiritual things. So this young man is a success story by all accounts. And add to that, 
He sincerely desires to know how to gain eternal life. And that tells us that he knows he doesn't have eternal life. And he's convinced Jesus will have the answer. And eternal life means to have life in the presence of God forever and ever. And let me say that this is a great question, a tremendous question and a sincere question. Hey, can you tell me how to get to heaven? How can I be saved? And, and quite honestly, using a baseball analogy, it's kind of like a fastball down the heart of the plate. If somebody comes up to you and says, can you tell me how I can be saved? How can I go to heaven? It, it would eliminate all of the, the preliminary stuff that we have to do to try to even get a conversation going with somebody if they just were to ask us, how can I get to heaven? So it's a, it's a wonderful question. Well, he comes to Jesus and he calls him good teacher. And Jesus questions him and says, why do you call me good? No one is good but one, and that is God. Now, some critics read this uh, and, and, and they say that Jesus was saying that he himself was not good and therefore he himself was not God. But he did not say that he wasn't good, and he did not say that he wasn't God. All he said was that only God was good. And remember, this young man doesn't think Jesus is God, right? He doesn't think Jesus is the Messiah. He just thinks Jesus is a man like him. So what Jesus is doing is showing him that his definition of good is bad, or his definition of good is wrong. Because this young man thinks that he can do a good thing to inherit eternal life. And Jesus strips that away by telling him the standard of good is God. And because he is good, that means his law is good. And his law is the standard for what is good, which this young man believes he fully observes. Now the problem that this young man has, and basically all of mankind has, is they think they could work for or earn their salvation. That's why he asks, what good thing shall I do? Shall I do? that I may have eternal life. You see, men believe that in them there is something that they, that they could do. There is some good in them that they could do in order to have eternal life. That they are able to please God and have somehow earning favor with Him. I remember when I was 25 years old, I was struggling with the meaning of life. I was an unsaved heathen at that point. Uh, and I didn't know why I even existed. I remember a friend of mine had just died from cancer and for like a two-week period, I was really believe it or not, you know, in a contemplative mode and wondering why I was here. And at the time, my girlfriend, who would be my wife, Claudia, uh, she said to me, well, I think, she was unsaved as well, she said, I think you should go and talk to a priest. He'll tell you why you're here. And so I did. I followed my wife's advice, uh, as I often do now. Uh, and, and, and it was this, as if I was going to the priest and saying to him, what must I do to have eternal life? That's what I was saying to him. And here was his answer to me. Be a good person. Make the world a better place. Well, I was damning counsel. Uh, but by God's grace, six years later, the gospel ripped into my heart and opened my heart and saved me. But the advice that that priest gave me is what most people think, that you can be a good person, that you could do something good. But the word of God says in Romans 3, there is none good, no, not one. Right? Ecclesiastes 7.20 says, Surely there is not a righteous man on earth who does good and never sins. And the reason no one can do good by God's standard is because our sin nature makes it impossible for us to do that. We could never meet God's standard of goodness. The only man that ever met God's goodness of st standard of goodness was the man Jesus Christ. A and it can only be applied to us by grace through faith in him. And so we see the desire. Secondly, let's look at the demand in verses 17 to 19. Jesus says, but if you want to enter eternal life, keep the commandments. He said to him, which ones? Jesus said, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, honor your father and your mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now what I mean by demand is the demand of the law. And what Jesus says is okay, if you want to enter into eternal life by doing something, then all you have to do is keep the commandments, and he means all of the commandments. And if this young man had asked this question in our day to many ministers in our day, well, they would have told him, well, just say the printer's prayer. Just sign the decision card. Just walk down the aisle as we, pre as we play, Jesus, I come. Just do those things. 
And they would immediately then baptize him. But Jesus doesn't do this. No, he looks into this man's soul. He sees his moralistic, legalistic, covetous heart. And he's trying to move him to see that as well. So he says to him, you got to keep the commandments. And what Jesus is doing is trying to get him to see that he does not keep the commandments. He does not keep the law. And he can't keep the law, nor can the law save him. So what Jesus, when he says keep the commandments, he's telling him to do something that is impossible for him to do. Because the requirements of the law is total obedience. In fact, in James chapter 2, verse 10, it tells us if you were to keep the whole law and just commit one sin, well, you're guilty of the whole law. In other words, one sin, one sin condemns a person to an eternal damnation. Now, the young man's response shows how steeped, how steeped he is in a self-righteous, legalistic, religious system. And it kind of blows us away when he says, which ones? Which ones? You know, maybe he's been a little negligent in this one or a little negligent in that one. Maybe he can do a little better in this one or a little in that one. Uh, and, and, and you need to understand he sincerely asks this question because in his mind, he keeps the commandments. He just doesn't see himself as a lawbreaker. So he honestly doesn't know which command or commands that he needs to keep that he isn't already keeping. And Jesus tries to bring, bring him to a place where he sees himself as a sinner and in need of grace. So he tells him to keep the sixth commandment, the seventh commandment, the eighth commandment, the ninth commandment, and the fifth commandment, which, which are called the second table of the law. And, 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 and then Jesus gives him the summary of all of that when he says, he says, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, which comes from Leviticus 19.18. And notice Jesus left out the Tenth Commandment from the second table of the law, which is you shall not covet. And the reason he left it out is because this man was very guilty of this, as he loved money and he loved possessions and he coveted them. They were his idol, they were his God, which ultimately made him a breaker of the first table of the law, as he was, have, he was to have no other gods but the God of Israel. So because this young man is secure in his self-righteousness, Jesus takes him to the law. He measures him up against the perfect word of God, against his standard, which is holiness. And he does so not to tell him how to be saved, but to show him that he couldn't be saved through it. Because Galatians 3.11 says, No one is justified by the law in the sight of God. So the law can't save you. And verse 24 says, of Galatians 3, that the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ. So the law teaches men that they're sinners, and fall short of the glory of God. It teaches them that we are unable to meet the demands of the law. And that should bring them to a place of desperation and hopelessness, and that should drive them to Christ, who perfectly kept the law on their behalf and paid the wages of their sins for them at the cross. And so we see the desire. Then we see the demand. And now, in verse 20, we see the deception. The young man said to him, All these things I have kept from my youth, what do I still lack? All these things I've kept from my youth. What do I still lack? Now, we'd expect him to say, all these things I have broken since my youth. What shall I do to have my sins pardoned? Right? You would expect him to say that when, when measured up against the law. But he doesn't. Instead, he says, all these things I have kept. I have kept from my youth. And of course, he's wrong. He's broken many commandments often, but in his mind, he hasn't. This is what Paul thought before he was saved. Right? He said in Philippians 3, 6, that concerning the righteousness which is in the law, he was blameless. Well, he wasn't blameless, but he thought he was. Meaning, in his mind, he kept the law. Now, the reason he thought he kept the law is because he didn't understand the law. He saw it as a bunch of external commands to be physically followed, but he could not grasp the spirit of the law. He couldn't grasp it. Jesus showed us the spirit of law in the Sermon on the Mount, when he said, if you hate someone, you've already committed murder in your heart. If you've lusted after a woman, you've already committed adultery in your heart. So you don't have to physically do something to sin. Sin comes from the heart and then works itself out of your mouth and your hands and your feet. But this young man doesn't understand this. And since he didn't literally kill anyone, or he didn't probably literally sleep with another woman other than his wife, well, he didn't see himself as a murderer or an adulterer. And thus, he saw himself as righteous. But Jesus said in Matthew 5, 20, 
unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. The point here being, it takes a perfect righteousness to qualify for eternal life. And even the guys that you think are the most righteous of men, and of course they were anything but, but to the Jew, to the average Jew, the scribes and Pharisees, they were the most righteous of men. He's saying, much greater than what you think they have. Well, this young man thinks that he has achieved this, which is why he says, well, what do I still lack? What do I still lack? And it's interesting because although he thinks he's righteous and although he thinks he's filled the law, fulfilled the law, he still knows in his soul that he doesn't have eternal life. He still knows he doesn't possess that. And he wants it, but he doesn't know how to get it. And sadly, the one who could give it to him is standing right in front of him, but he can't see it because he can't see himself as he really is, which is a sinner. And he is totally blind to his condition. And how many people are there like him sitting in churches today who are religious and morally upright and, by the, and, 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 and good by the world's standards? And they give and they serve, but they have a massive void in their soul. Christ is not in them. They are religious, but they are not righteous. They may know much about religion and tradition and maybe even theology. They may know lots of verses, but nothing about life in the Spirit. They talk about the cross. They talk about the blood of Jesus. But the cross and the blood of Jesus has never caused a radical change in their hearts. And, the, and like the rich young ruler, they are trusting in their works. They are trusting in their accomplishments. They are ultimately trusting in themselves. And what they lack is life-changing, saving grace. Is that you today? Are you a religious person but not a righteous person? Do you have a lot of head knowledge but it's never hit the heart? I hope that's not the case. Well, we see the desire, the demand, the deception. Fourthly, the decree in verse 21. Jesus said to him, if you want to be perfect, go. Sell what you have and give to the poor. And you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. The young man says, what do I lack? And Jesus says, well, if you want to be perfect, sell everything. Sell your stuff, give it to the poor, and then come follow me. And perfect means complete. Uh, and in this context, it means qualified for eternal life. So what Jesus is saying is, okay, you, if you want eternal life, you want to have that, the first thing you got to do is lose the idol of your heart. Lose the idol of your heart. And the idol of his heart is money. right? And he goes, you love it more than you could ever love me, therefore you need to lose it. Now, Jesus isn't making a command for all men for all time that whoever wants to follow him, they gotta, they gotta sell everything they have and they gotta live, they gotta live like, you know, like paupers. He's not saying that, right? I'm not saying that at all. But this young man's God was his money. So he needed to see that, and then he needed to lose that because it hindered him from entering the kingdom of heaven. Listen, you can't keep your sin and come into the kingdom of God. You just can't do it. You can't have Jesus and another God. Well, this young man's treasure was on earth and not in heaven. And he had to lose his earthly treasure before he could gain heavenly treasure. Now, for some people, if they want to be perfect, they have to kill their worldly dreams and ambitions. Or they have to crush their independent spirit. Or they have to part with their old friends. Or they got to stop having sex outside of marriage. Or they have to say goodbye to a homosexual lifestyle or a lesbian lifestyle. Right? Or they have to leave a dishonest job or destroy the monitor that they view pornography on or spend countless hours playing video games on. The point is, whatever is keeping you from wholly surrendering to Christ, you got to let that go. That has got to leave. And in this young man's case, it was his money and his stuff. And this is why Paul said in 1 Timothy 6 that the love of money was the root of all kinds of evil. Not that money in and of itself is evil, but when you love it, it, it causes evil. It causes all kinds of it. So Jesus says, sell everything, give it all away, and then follow me. And Mark adds, take up your cross and follow me. So if this young man wants to find eternal life, he must confess his sin, he must forsake his sin, and then he must follow Jesus. And following Jesus means dying to self and surrendering your will to his will. And then he will be perfect, and, and then he will be right in God's eyes because Jesus' righteousness will be credited to his account. Jesus' perfect sinless life will be as if it, it were his before God. 
and God will accept that. And anything less than this means that you lack something, that you lack something. Well, fifth and lastly, in verse 22, let's look at the, the despair. In verse 22 we read, But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Jesus tells the man what it's going to cost him, and the young man is rocked, and Mark said, said at his word. Said at his word. And we read that he went away sorrowful. Why? Because he had great possessions, and he loved his possessions, and he didn't want to part with his stuff. You know, in that moment, he had a choice to make. Obey Jesus, sell all of his stuff, give it to the poor, and follow Jesus, or hold on to his possessions. Jesus said, either get rid of your, the God of your heart right now and follow me, or keep it and go away. And he chose his possessions over life in Christ and life with Christ. And notice that the rich young ruler, he's not mad. He doesn't debate with Jesus because he knows exactly what he's saying. He knows exactly what's at stake. He knows what it's going to take to inherit eternal life. And at the end of the day, he's not willing to part with his stuff. He's not willing. He is not willing to part with it. He'll do a good work. He'll do something, whatever it is, but he won't part with his sin. He won't part with his sin. And how many people come close to the kingdom of heaven and they know that it will cost them to follow Jesus, but they don't want to part with their sin. They don't want to give up what they love so much because they value the earthly over the heavenly, the temporal over the eternal, the flesh over the spirit. Listen, this young man could have left walking and leaping and praising God, but instead he went away sorrowful. And notice, Jesus doesn't chase him down. Jesus doesn't go after him. Doesn't plead with him to change his mind. He doesn't lower the qualifications. All right, all right, sell half your stuff now, 25% more later on, and, and slowly but surely, you know, dissipate the wealth. He doesn't do that. Jesus lets the man go. He lets him go. He doesn't change the qualifications for entering the kingdom. And brothers and sisters, we cannot do that either. We cannot change the qualifications or massage or lessen the qualifications for a man to be saved. He must recognize his sin. He must repent of his sin. He must come to Christ. And he must trust Christ and Christ alone. We can't, we can't fudge or play with or lessen the qualifications this man loved money and possessions more than he loved Jesus, and Jesus let him go. And again, we must do the same. We must never add to the Word of God or take away from it to make it more palatable. We must do the same. Well, in closing, let me say that the rich young ruler is a very appropriate lesson for us and for all men because it shreds any hope that in any way anyone could earn favor with God on their own. It strips man of any goodness that he thinks he has. And it shows the futility of trying to keep the law to be right with God. And it shows us that a person can desire to be saved and have all the right info on how to be saved and be lost forever. It shows us that. It shows us that though one may outwardly seem like a righteous person, inwardly they may be a foreigner to grace. Listen, the rich young ruler had a lot going for him. And if there was ever a man that you would be spiritually encouraged about, and hopeful for that he would find salvation, it would be him. I mean, when someone says, how could I be saved? I want to be saved. We, we're hopeful, and we should be hopeful. But he walked away from it. He walked away from it. Because he couldn't grasp his own sin, and his heart was set on something other than God. And although he had great advantages, and although he was personally evangelized by Jesus, and, and although he had, he, the free gift of life was put before him, in the end, he walks away from Jesus. So I leave you with these questions. Have you forsaken your sin and followed Jesus? Are you certain that you have eternal life? And if so, are you wholly relying on the work of Jesus at Calvary's cross on your behalf? And is the evidence of that a changed life? A changed life. And if you can't honestly answer yes to these questions, then that means that that something else is the God of your heart and you are unwilling to part with it. Uh, and, 
and, and you will not only leave this world sad and sorrowful, but miserable and tormented, and that's forever and ever. But the offer of eternal life goes out to you this day, as it did go out to the rich young ruler. But you must recognize your fatal condition and forsake your sins and follow Jesus. And if you do, if you do, you will know the joy and gladness that it is to be his in this life and the glory to come, and you must do it today. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that Christ came to save sinners. And we thank you, Lord, anyone can be saved who comes to him his way. We pray that you would put it on the, the hearts and souls of men to know that they have a great need. And that need is Christ, that they cannot do something to earn favor with you, O God. The only thing you accept is the blood of your Son. And Lord, for those of us who know you, I pray that we would honor you and exalt you by trusting the sovereignty of God in our salvation. And that we would share the truth with men who are perishing what they truly and desperately need. And Lord, we would do it for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, let me uh, leave you with a few thoughts and a few things. First of all, at the end of, uh, underneath this, this um, sermon that you're looking at online, uh, there are a bunch of questions uh, that will pertain to the, to the sermon that I just preached. Uh, and we would ask you to uh, take a look at those. And if you're with others around you, maybe your family, even a few others at your home, uh, would you discuss these questions? Uh, and, um, uh, and if not, if you're by yourself, would you meditate on them? Or maybe call a brother or a sister uh, and talk about these, these things to keep us engaged in spiritual matters. Uh, also, uh, below you, uh, there is a, a, a link on how you can give. Uh, although we cannot meet at the church, we still have expenses. Uh, and usually, I believe the large majority of what is given to Grace Baptist Church happens in the church building at the service when the plate goes around. I think the large majority of it comes from there. Uh, and so since we will not be able to meet, uh, would you prayerfully consider going on to one of, I believe, four options you have to give? Uh, and would you give uh, whatever your offering would be uh, to, Graf to Grace Baptist Church as you, you would give unto the Lord? Uh, and also, uh, we need to stay in touch. Uh, and as I said before, there are many ways we're going to be doing that. Uh, we will continually be giving you information as it comes to us concerning Grace Baptist Church and each other as we have prayer needs and uh, other needs as well, uh, whether it be through Facebook, and there are two Facebook pages for Grace Baptist Church, uh, and or the text messaging, the Remind text messaging, uh, and of course, uh, uh, YouTube as well. Uh, and if you are not on uh, any of these, Again, you can call me and I will put you on them or Dan or someone else will put you on and my number is 646-208-1651. 646-208-1651. And brethren, don't, don't, don't despair. God's in control. The coronavirus, uh, it's God's virus. He has created it. He is using it for his means and purposes. Remember what Amos 3 says, if there is calamity in the city, will not the Lord have done it? Uh, we trust in the God who is God over all and sovereign over all, who has us in his hands. Uh, so let us not fear. Let us not panic. God will give us nothing that he has not ordained for us to have. Uh, and we are really the only voice of reason right now. We are the only voice of hope where men are fearing terribly catching a, a physical virus. Uh, but they're infected with a, with a physical or a spiritual disease called sin. And they need to know that that ends a lot worse than even what a virus could do to you. Uh, and we need to give them the hope of the gospel. So please be about that in any way you can. God bless you.